Um, you know, as, as I picked out this scripture at the beginning of the week, um, boy, I struggled with where to go with it. It just wasn't wasn't coming. And, and and I was spending time in prayer about it, and I hate to say it, but there's times when you, you you do pray, and sometimes you just feel like there's a block there. There's just something in the way. And then I was I was driving somewhere to work, and I heard Tip Ingram say, talk about prayer, and about having a breakthrough in prayer. And how often, so many times, we stop before we get to that breakthrough. You know, we, ah, it's just not working today. I guess I'm just not, I'm busy or I'm distracted or well, I'll try again later. Then we don't try and then we don't come back to it. And, and I, you know, felt a little convicted of that. But he talked about, you know, sticking it out and purposely praying because he said the Father promises to bring us to the throne, through the Spirit to bring us to the throne room of God through prayer. He said, keep that in mind and don't be afraid to ask God, Father, bring me there. Bring me to the foot of the Father. Allow me to be in that throne room in prayer with the Father. And that really hit me. And it caused me to be a little more focused. And I ended up having a lot more to go into this than I had planned on. So we won't, <laughs> we're not going to get it all today. But um, it is important. Don't give up too easily. You know, 10, 15 minutes might seem like a long time, but, it, but that 10, 15 minutes it takes in prayer to get to that breakthrough can lead to a whole lot more and a lot more productive prayer. So don't be afraid to stick it out. And, and, and that takes work. It takes work to make ourselves sit there that long, to devote that much time. But think of how many things we devote our time to. So we can afford to set aside a half an hour for the Lord in the morning. We're going to be in Matthew 20 today. And this will be New King James Version for any of you who are following along in your Bibles. They're not terribly, sometimes it's, there can be quite a variation. There's not a huge one if you're using NIV or something like that. There's not a huge variation today. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 16. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. Starting in verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, No one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into my vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when these came, and when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men that, were, that worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the dead. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go away. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. It is, not lawful for, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, as always, for your word. Father, for your living, breathing word. Lord, through your spirit, open up the hearts of each and everyone in here this morning, Lord. They may hear what you have for them in this message. Father, I ask that you help me to speak clearly and boldly, Lord, that you would speak through me. Lord, that these would not be my message, but yours. 
I thank you for this this morning, Lord. I thank you for each soul sitting in these seats this morning. We praise you that they are here in your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is a passage that I don't believe I've ever, ever preached from before. Um, in fact, I've read it a lot more this week than I have in all other years combined. You may know and you may not that this is the only book in the New Testament in which this parable is told. Although the theme of it that we see here in this parable is, is intertwined all throughout the scriptures. And we'll see a little bit of that today. He does this for good reason. Because those who really have understood it over the years have made some of the most notable contributions to the cause for Christ in the last 2,000 plus years. And when we understand this, we understand where our priorities need to be. And hopefully we are convicted enough to implement the changes that are needed. So with that, let's begin. I want to, I want to be able to work through these parables this morning to see where we sit in there, where we fit in that. And to do that, we have to look and see what, what was it to those who it was being read to, those who were sitting there hearing it from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. Verses 1 and 2 said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Like I said, to see how this applies today, we have to to explore what it meant to them, to the disciples that were here hearing this parable. This story, this parable, especially I'm thinking of some of you kids, the older kids that are still up here, they didn't go downstairs. A parable is a story that Jesus told to help understand what he was teaching, to help relate it to them so that they would grasp what it is he was trying to teach them, that they would better understand it. And if our hearts are open, if you're here this morning and your heart is open, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Hopefully these words ring clear as ever in your hearts this morning as we go through this parable. Now the owner of the vineyard, the owner in question here that Jesus is talking about is God the Father. He is the one who has hired the laborers. He is the one who has set the wage that he deems to be fair. Now, when written, the disciples were thinking to themselves, like, okay, we get the, we're the first ones hired. Okay, we know who we are. We think that's us. We figured that out. There's a reason Jesus is telling this parable. They thought of themselves as that first bunch. The first ones hired for a task. A task that they felt they were working hard at. A task that, that was hard. That it was no difficult task being a laborer for the Lord. He continues in verses 3 to 7, And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went again. He went out about the sixth and the ninth hour. Not six and nine o'clock. Six and the ninth hour. This is like the ninth hour of labor throughout the day. The first guys are getting tired by now. And he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? Because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. These were the ones at the 11th hour. And whatever is right, you will receive. The third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, the eleventh hour. The owner went out all day long to bring in as many workers as he could, promising to pay them a fair wage. Now why would the owner of a vineyard do such a thing? Why would a master keep going all day long? He's only getting an hour's work out of that last group of many hired. I mean, why bother? There appears to be a sense of urgency on the part of this landowner, of the vineyard. My crops are ready. The grapes are ripe. I've got to get them picked. I'm going to go up until the last hour of daylight trying to get somebody to come in and pick these things. There is an urgency, and I want, to, I, want to, I want us to try to get that today. So I, have, I think we can relate that really well, actually, to today. You think of agriculture today. Mm -hmm. Most of us should understand that, and, and it doesn't matter the size of the crop. Look at the agriculture in our nation today. It doesn't matter if you have a small garden to feed your family, 
or if you're planting 2,000 acres for your dairy cows, or if you're growing vegetables to put in bags for Green Giant. When the crop is ready, there is an urgency to go and get it. It has to be got in. There's a very small window where the quality of that crop is worth picking. Pretty soon it starts to decline. And what's worse, there are dozens of other factors out of, out of the control of the owner that could completely ruin the crop in an instant before they even start to harvest. They're against the clock all the time. Think about your garden. Some of you have green beans. You don't want your green beans 10 inches long with a bean in there the size of a marble. <laughs> Some of you have chewed on them. You know what they taste like. You don't want them. There's a small window where, and, and Haley and I run into that. You go out and it's like, they're all right. Like, whoa, like, just like that. Your tomatoes, you pick them just a hair early. Because around here the blight gets them and destroys them. You've got to almost pick them green and hope that they ripen. If you leave, and if they don't get the blight, the bugs will eat them when they're red. You can't win. Fruit growers are no different. When the fruit on the trees is ripe, it has to get picked. Or the quality starts to go down. I wish Craig was here this morning. I could compare it to his vineyard. Vineyard. Orchard. Wrong, pro wrong product. Football. Soccer. Grapes. Apples. Whatever. It's fruit. But think about that. Their, their fruit starts to drop. They've got to worry about frost, not just in the fall, but in the spring as well. Hurricanes, tornadoes, severe thunderstorms, hail. This year, rain. You, you can't win. The urgency to harvest is just as prevalent the bigger and the bigger you go, maybe more so. Your dairy farmers, they're, they're trying to get as many crops of hay off a of field as they can. They'll cut it like every 28 to 30 days now. Trying to get high-protein feed. Then the, the corn, again, the rain can ruin that, but, but think about the corn. They're looking for a little tiny narrow window where the moisture is just right and the kernels are in the right spot and there's so much more to it. It gives them such a small window because once that frost comes, the, the quality of that feed just goes through the floor. They have a very small window. Your commercial growers, no different. Their livelihood and the livelihood of all their workers depends on the timing of harvesting that crop. Those big grocery chains, those big big suppliers that they're sending this food to, they want it. They don't care what you have to do with it. They, don't, they, they want it now, and they want the best quality. Again, a bad storm, a drought, a flood, anything could wipe out the whole thing. Could ruin a business. A salmonella recall. Think of how many we have of them anymore. They put whole businesses out of business because of one little thing. I don't even know what you call that, but a bacteria, whatever it is. Hundreds of people can lose their jobs just like that. So there is a sense of urgency. What do they do about it? You see dozens of combines in these fields worth hundreds of thousands of dollars a piece going 24 hours a day because there's that window. They've got to get it now. Your smaller vegetables, same way. Hundreds of men, women, and children out in the fields picking and picking and picking, trying to get them while they're ripe. And bigger is important, yes, but think of even smaller. The provinces in China where they have the rice paddies. The families come together. They all plant at the same time. They all harvest at the same time because in those villages, not harvesting that crop on time can be a matter of life and death. That is their food supply. It's what God has given them to be able to grow in that area. And they have to do it just right. There's so much work to be done and so few to do it. Matthew 9, chapter 9, verse 37 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. When there is a window, to harvest. There is always a sense of urgency. That is why the owner of the vineyard kept going out into the street. His crop was ready for harvest. His crop was ready and a killing frost was coming. It's no different today. We're in a late hour of that harvest and that frost is coming. Now that owner, that owner that represents God, right? And his disciples were listening, thinking, well, we're the first ones hired. 
But where does that put us? We should be aware there's that preordained window of time for harvest. God has decided there's this much time for harvest. We don't know how long that time is. Only he knows. Matthew 24, 36. But of the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. You can see why. For God, for the disciples, and hopefully for us, hopefully we understand that today, that there is a sense of urgency. So where, where do we fit in? Where are all these others in different hours? Where were they chosen? What stage are we in? There's no way to be sure. There's no way to know which exactly which ones we are. If you come from the perspective of the disciples who were chosen first, you know that we're not those. You got that unruled. We're not the first ones. I would venture to say enough time has gone by that those chosen, you know, a few hours later, they've probably already been chosen too. Those labors have come and gone. In the time since they were chosen, many have been saved for eternity because of their dedication to that urgent task. Because those who had already been chosen worked diligently. So though we cannot know the day and the hour, and I'm not one of those who's ever going to try to guess. There's many over the years who have tried to say, well, it's coming to this hour and this day. And guess what? That hour and that day it keeps on going. But I do feel confident in saying that we were not chosen first. And I'm certain that we're getting closer to that 11th hour all the time. And our time was to labor for the Lord grows shorter and shorter with each waning day. So we're somewhere in that parable. We're one of those. Could be closer than we think. We could have been picked earlier than we think. Does it matter? Does it change anything? Should it change anything? Should it change our attitude towards working for the Lord, towards laboring for the Lord? In this parable, we see it affect a couple of people's attitudes regarding where they were chosen. The return of Christ is coming. The days of laboring for the Lord on this earth will come to an end. Will it matter when you began your good work? When he began to use you? I say this to all of us because I wish for all of us to become more than, than just believers, to become laborers, serving our awesome God until that return. Because so many of us are missing out. He has so much more planned. Verse 8. So when the evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. What's our wages? What's he promising us? What were you promised when he called you to work? Many of you have already made that decision. You have come before the Lord. You have sat at the feet of Jesus and, and asked for that forgiveness and made that decision to follow him based on a price that was already determined, that was already paid. If it was in the ways of the world today, we'd be negotiating with it. We'd have a whole list of of conditions and questions for our employer. We'd want to know what the benefit package is. What does that include? Is there vacation time? Is there time off? What's the perks of the job? We're so leery to do what we see here. To agree, look at the guys in the 11th hour, they agree, they, well, I'll give you a fair wage. Okay, we're going to work. That fair wage is already established. And I'll tell you what, it's a bargain. Let's see how those in the parable handle it. Verses 9 to 12. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they received a denarius. But when the first came, they, they, <clears throat> excuse me, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour. And you made them equal to us who have borne the burden in the heat of the day. They felt, those hired first felt, as though they were being shorted. As though they deserved more than the others. They labored for the whole day, while some for, some for only half, some for only an hour. 
Yet all were paid, paid the same. Was it fair? Was it fair? There's a couple things that have been asked of Jesus shortly before this happened. The disciples were obviously thinking about, what are we getting for this? We've been working pretty hard. We've gone through some awful stuff, and they have. Jesus tells this parable that his disciples shortly after being asked, Matthew 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? In Matthew 19, 27, Peter says, and Peter answered and said to him, see, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? To which Jesus replied in chapter 19. So Jesus said to them, actually, or sorry, assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters, this should sound familiar, or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. As we said, this theme goes throughout the scriptures. I read you Jesus' reply to Peter because, as I said in the beginning, the theme keeps going. It's echoed throughout the scriptures, and, and Peter is just one instance, the landowner in our parable today. He listens to the complaints and he responds accordingly. Verses 13 to 16. But then he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius wages? Take what is yours and go away. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Like the workers here, those, those who are grumbling about their pay. Do we grumble? We were bought for a price. A price that we knew when we signed up. The disciples knew when they signed up. What the inheritance was. What the pay was. Whatever you want to call it. When we came before the Lord seeking forgiveness for sins that we couldn't pay back. Asking for a ticket to a place that we didn't deserve to go. We knew what he was offering. We knew what had been paid. Our way was already paid. Yet, yet many, like these men, feel that we're owed more. That we ought to have some more say in what's going on. As I mentioned earlier, I think we kind of got a bargain. We are getting a bargain. We don't deserve to get what our Savior offers, what this Master is willing to pay these laborers. Yet it's ours nonetheless. Yet He gives it freely. Yeah, sure, the ones in the last hour, maybe they didn't deserve to get paid in an to pick grapes for an hour. <clears throat> How can we have the nerve like those workers in scriptures to be content, to not be content with what has already been given? Now, I hope for each of you, as it did for me, that this gives you a little bit to think about. That perhaps you have an understanding of the parable we read today. It became apparent to me that I wasn't going to get through this today. And my goal was to get through this parable so that we can focus on what was paid next week. So we can focus on what he promises. About the promise made by our Father in heaven. As well as our attitudes towards laboring for the Lord. Quite often we get in this rut. We get in this, this attitude of, well, I, I put my time in. I'm good. It doesn't work that way. Just because we were picked early doesn't mean we're to stop laboring. And because we were picked late, because we came to know him late, doesn't mean we don't need to start. Doesn't mean that we need to not work as hard as we can for that last hour. We're still in that window of harvest. Who are we to say that the gift of salvation is not enough? 
that it's not a fair price. The fact that we will not spend eternity in hell, as I said, we're getting the bargain. The place we deserve to go, and we've got a ticket out of there. We get to be in eternity. Does that not seem like a fair price for all? So as you go from this place today, please know that, that we have been chosen by a mighty God. A God that keeps his word. A God that is just and fair. A God that will shortly come to settle accounts with those who have laid for him, whether it's one day or a hundred years. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning. Lord, that those who are here that know you, Lord, they have been chosen. Lord, regardless of the time that they have come to know you, regardless of how late it is, you have chosen them. You have chosen them for this task, Lord. Each of us for this task. The task of laboring for you, for what is a wage that we don't deserve. But you give it to us freely, Lord. Each and every one, you offer it freely. No strings. Father, help each one here to be renewed in that promise, Lord. To know that it's for them. Father, that it's not a promise that goes away. It's, it's not something that, that, that is gone. Father, we still have that ticket. Lord, help us out of the joy of knowing we have received that to be eager for you. To serve eagerly. To share eagerly. To love eagerly, Lord. Father, I ask that your spirit would impress that on each in every heart here. Lord, it's those that don't know you here, who aren't sure, that are on the fence. Lord, that they would that they would realize that that gift is free. Lord, that you give it. That salvation is free. That the forgiveness of our sins is free. We praise you for it this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in the same scriptures as last week. Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. We're going to go back through them this morning. Um, we're not going to break them all down like we did last week, but we're going to reread that because we are continuing with that message today. And our title, I don't know if I that last week, was last but not least, which is important. It, it really should resonate with us, not only from last week, but today as well. So let's start in Matthew 20. We're in the New King James Version for these first scriptures this morning. Um, and it doesn't happen to match what you're reading. But as I said, there's not a huge difference in, in these particular scriptures. So starting in Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius wage, denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, and again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found, not eleven o'clock, eleventh hour. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when the evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, <laughs> that they likewise, but they, and they likewise received each a denarius. And then they, when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go away. I wish 
to give to this last man the same as to you? Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Father, for those of us that know you, to be chosen, Lord. Father, I pray for any of you that don't, that, that they would become one of the chosen, Lord. That they would come to know you as their Savior. That they would come to receive that gift that is offered, that eternal life, Lord, that wage. Father, that is more than enough. We thank you for that today, Lord. Father, I ask you to be with me as I speak today. Lord, help me to speak clearly. Lord, help the hearts in this room, including mine, to be open to your word, to what you have in it for each of us. We thank you that there is always a word for each of us. Thank you for that today, Lord. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. I did have a prayer. Keep um, the root sister Brenda in your prayers as she has had some surgery this week. Um, keep her in your prayers. Knee replacement, I believe, right? So keep her in your prayers. That's not fun. Um, that's <laughs> not at all. So keep her in your prayers. That she'd get mobile very quickly and it would heal quickly. I forgot to mention that earlier. I wanted to... To get that in. So we left off last week going through the scriptures. We learned that the owner of the vineyard in this parable was God the Father. The workers being chosen that they talked about all throughout the days, the different hours of the days, that's us. <coughs> that's you and I and every person who has made the decision to confess their faith in Jesus Christ, to repent of their sins and receive forgiveness offered to Jesus Christ. And any that are yet to come because he hasn't come yet. Another bit of information, something we touched on briefly, the wage paid, the denarius they talk about in the, in the parable, the wage agreed upon by the first ones hired as well as the last. Each of them were paid that same wage. A fair wage for all, maybe more than fair for all. The wage for us, the wage paid to us as laborers in the kingdom of God regardless of of when we came to know Christ, the first or the last, as it says, it doesn't matter. The wage was this, the assurance of salvation to eternal life. Eternal life. Does that seem fair? For what Christ received, does that seem fair for us laboring in the kingdom of God? It is simply and yet beautifully stated in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Shall not perish, but have eternal life. That was the wage offered to the first chosen, and will be offered to the last chosen. Maybe it's better described as a gift in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. After all, that's what salvation is. More than a wage, it's a gift. One that is given freely upon choosing to believe in and follow Jesus Christ. So how do we feel about that? Perhaps you became a follower 60 years ago. Perhaps it was yesterday. The Lord knows your heart. He knows when you have made that decision. Either way, when you chose to do so, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, when you asked him into your heart and confessed him as Lord, you received the promise, the gift of salvation, eternal life with the Father. Before we continue, let me ask you this. Now, it may seem like a silly question, but they get an like stir something inside of you. It might irritate you that I would ask you such a question today. But I want you to consider this question before you have to ponder it, standing before our Lord and Savior. Have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Sounds like a silly question, right? To, to be asking here today. But have you ever really stopped and actually prayed a prayer to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? To ask Him into your heart. If you did, did you mean it? That, don't want to hear today, anybody, but did you mean it? Because I know I prayed it years ago and didn't mean it. And nothing happened because I didn't mean it. Did you experience a change in your life? Those of you who have, you know what I'm talking about. Because things change. I ask this because it matters. 
it matters in understanding what we're getting at in these scriptures today. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The only way. The only way to one day stand in the presence of the Father for eternity is through faith in Jesus Christ. There's a whole other sermon for that, but... I am simply trying to encourage, imploring each of you to be sure that you have made that decision. It's not enough to be a good person, to go to church every Sunday, or to give the most money. That's not what gets you there. It's not enough to say, I believe in God, so I'm good. That's been on my mind a lot. I had a conversation about a week ago with a young man. And that was the gist of it. I believe in God. I would have said the same thing years ago. In my teenage years, I would have said the same thing. And I was no closer to God because I didn't understand it. I could say, I probably did say in a few occasions, I believe in God, but I didn't know who God was. To me, God was just a thing, a name, a distant thought. I knew nothing of who Jesus really was. I didn't know that he was the way to the Father. I didn't know that he was the way to eternal life. So many have that concept that, that they're the same, that you have to go through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. So please, please today as we continue, be certain that you know, that you have faith, that you believe in Jesus Christ, through whom comes salvation to eternal life. Because what we are discussing today what we are studying in these scriptures is based on following Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Sorry for the rabbit trail, but that is important to think about. We don't ask that enough. There are many who have grown up in churches all throughout the world who don't understand whether it's because they don't believe or because they haven't been taught properly that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation. Now, continuing on to the assumption that most of you here have made that decision that you are a fellow laborer in the vineyard, a fellow, labor, a fellow child of God. How do you feel about that being your wage, about that being what's offered? Is there a sense of urgency? That We talked about that last week. There needs to be a sense of urgency. If we're living a life of, after Christ, if we're obeying the Holy Spirit, there should be a sense of urgency. The master's urgency that we saw in the parable should become our sense of urgency. We've been chosen to labor in the harvest, not of grapes, but of souls for the kingdom of God. But the church today and the world has become lackadaisical in the, in the assigned task. You could say we, we've shirked a task. I like that term. It doesn't get used anymore today. It's safe to say we've done so for so long that there isn't any urgency. There should be not only an urgency to harvest, but also an urgency to sow seeds. We have lost a couple generations of young men and women. We as a church enjoyed a window of time. And I thought about this, and I, I thought about it on and off for a while, but a time after the great wars when, when the church, when going to church, when having faith is just what you did. Because there was the very real realization that good and evil were very real. It was seen what evil could do. Very plainly what evil could do. So it was ever more permanent in people's minds than ever. The difference between good and evil. That the need for God to intervene in worldly affairs was more urgent than ever before. And he did. The reality that we were not promised tomorrow was very pertinent. And you have, we saw everybody stand that, were, that, that has served their country here. To you, you know tomorrow is not promised to any of us. But somewhere, I, don't, I can't tell you when, I can't tell you why, something changed. The sense of urgency waned for some reason. You might say that many churches went into self-preservation mode because things got going good. Well, just we can maintain that. You might say that they got comfortable because things were good for a while. But while we, while we were comfortable, while we were coasting, the enemy gained ground. And we missed out on those generations of men and women who have been swallowed up by the world. 
You've heard it said as it says in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He was waiting. He was waiting for us to get comfortable. He might have took a beating for a while, but then he sat back and he waited. And he took full advantage of the situation. And I don't know about you, but I've had enough of that. I know the Lord's had enough of it. So my prayer today is that the Spirit of the Lord will light a fire under each and every one of us. That your prayer would be for the Spirit to be renewed within each of you. That the Lord's desire would be our desire. That the, what the Lord despises, we would despise. And what the Lord loves, we would love. But that takes one thing. A sense of urgency. And to have that sense of urgency, we must realize how important that salvation is. How big a deal it is. What the alternative is. Not just for us, but for those who haven't received it yet, because there's a harsh reality. There's two sides to eternity. Before we were saved, before we knew Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were bound for a much different eternal destination. One that if a person truly recognizes the reality about it, if they, if they could see the difference and understand, they'd certainly choose the alternative, alternative of eternity with Christ. Matthew 13, 49 to 50 says, This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, and they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not a desirable end. In fact, the worst end. And some will face it. The best way I can think to emphasize this point, the difference between the two choices you can make, following Christ or not, comes out of Matthew 25, the first being in verses 31 to 40. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another. As a shepherd, shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by the Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothes you. When did we see you as sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. What we just read, what they did and didn't even know they did it, was the result of laboring with a sense of urgency, of following the life of Christ, of living as Christ did, of letting the Spirit lead us. He leads us in those things. He helps us to make those decisions to know right from wrong, to know who to help. He tells us. That is a result of laboring and urgency. Sounds great, doesn't it? But do we take it for granted? Do, do we think it's enough? After all, some, some have put in their time. Some have labored for years. And just like in the parable, we, we earned that eternal life long ago. That's somebody else's responsibility to worry about it now. That was the attitude in the parable. There was grumblings about the wages they were paid. They felt they had earned more. They expected more. Verse 34 said, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the beginning, since the creation of the world. That's our wage. That's the gift. You can't earn that. What is offered by our Savior is a gift that He gives out of love. Love for His creation. He asks. All He asks is that we believe in Him, that we follow Him. Our time is enough. We're still here. We don't retire from a labor of love that is serving our Lord. Our tasks, our obligations, they might change 
As we change, we grow, we change, we get older. Things are different. But that obligation doesn't go away. If we were listening for and obeying the leading of the Spirit, then we ought to find joy in serving and following Him. In doing this, others will see the love of Christ as this, just like we saw in these passages. He says, you did this for me. You fed me. You clothed me. You visited me. You cared for me. Those things are done out of love. Are they work? Yes. But done out of love. Verses 41 to 46 tells a different story. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. He said, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That is the fate of those when the time comes who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ. Do not let that be your faith. I cannot know your heart. Jesus knows your heart today. Two different endings. One important choice to make. As we read in the parable, it doesn't matter whether you were the first to believe, whether you chose to believe in Christ today. If you made that choice, then you have a place in eternity with the Father. That in itself, when you realize the significance of it, should put upon your heart that sense of urgency, that desire that no one should have to face the other option. That no one should have not at least have an opportunity to receive and believe in Jesus Christ. You can't force them. That's our part. We can't. But they should at least have the opportunity now it sounds like I'm beating a dead horse here, but but I but I'll continue to. Because it is in fact a matter of life and death, a matter of eternal salvation. I harp on it because in the in the world today, in the church of Jesus Christ, for many the urgency is not there. For many, the ways of the Spirit that we just read over, where Jesus said, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. He was thirsty. They gave him a drink. The stranger that they invited in, the clothes that they provided, the sick that they cared for, the, the, the ones in prison that they visited, these acts of love which, which come as a result of obeying the Spirit are not being seen nearly enough today. And all I can figure, I, I, I thought about this and read and all I can figure is either we have allowed ourselves, as I said, to get comfortable and allow the things of the world to slowly turn our gaze away from the path we should be on. Or that many have not truly surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. In many cases, we, we say it's a worldly problem. We blame things on the world, but even in the church. We get consumed with status, with finances, with, 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 with what the outside world thinks of us. There's the backbiting, the gossip, the malicious rumors and talk that we, we always blame on the world, but it happens here. It happens in the church. There was a survey the other day, and I can't, I'm supposed to, you're supposed to cite sources, I can't tell you other than it was on that felt, and I don't. I wasn't paying enough attention when they announced what study it was. 10%, they surveyed, and 10% said that of Americans attend church every Sunday. That's a sad number, but not a surprising number. And I don't mention that to guilt you into coming, church, coming to church every Sunday, or to say that attendance equals salvation, because that's not the case. I mention it because I want you to be able to recall just how hard it is to walk the narrow road, to recognize where our priorities are, where they have to be. 
and just how surprised many are going to be when it comes time to stand judgment. I didn't write it down, but the scripture comes to mind where, where many will stand before Jesus and he'll say, away from me, I never knew you. I don't want that to be the case for anybody in this group, anybody in this church, anybody in this community for that matter. I don't want that to ever be the case. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. The heading says, The narrow and the wide gates, even though, even enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. So as I said, 10% is not a surprising number. Only a few ever find it. The Lord is calling each of us to be one of the few that finds the narrow gate. And what we're called to do, to follow Jesus Christ, is not for the faint of heart. There are those in the world today that paint a splendid picture that it's all roses and cupcakes. That's not... Sorry, I just come out. Um, but, but it's not... It's preached in many places to partially to fill the seats and to fill the coffers, and it only leads to disappointment and destruction. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, we will recognize them. The struggle is very real. The war that rages in a realm that we can't even see around us continues even now. And it's imperative for your sake and for mine, as well as the sake of our children, that we be willing to surrender our lives completely to Jesus Christ, that we obey the leading of the Spirit, that we let Him guide us so we can stay on that narrow path, so we can find that narrow gate. And in doing so, we will feel that sense of urgency, because the Holy Spirit has a sense of urgency. And that urgency should start right here in our church, in our families, in our neighborhood. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, have been hired. We have been given a wage more than fair. A wage that will sustain us. Let us labor earnestly until the day of Christ's glorious return so that one day we may join among the shouts of acclamation that we may enter the kingdom for eternity. Let us pray together today. Heavenly Father, I thank you today, Lord. Father, that the wage paid was enough. That what Christ did, and that what we are offered through what he did, it was enough. Father, and it's offered to every single person in this room, Lord. Whether they came to know you years ago, or they're deciding right now. Lord, that gift of eternal life is theirs. They don't have to no longer think about which side of eternity they're going to be on. Thank you for that today. Father, I pray that you would, you would place in each and every one of us that sense of urgency. Father, that you would soften our hearts that when we hear the leading of the Spirit, we don't ignore it. That we won't be distracted by the things of the world. That we won't let the things of the world infiltrate your church. Father, let you always be our ways. Thank you. Today, Lord, and I thank you for each and everyone here today, Lord, who has come, who has taken the time to hear your word, to worship you. Thank you for it today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.